All right, let's dive in. Today, we're tackling global warming. Oh, this is a big one. It is, and you guys sent in some really interesting stuff. You always do, I have to say. Especially some excerpts from uh, Phased Text. <laughs> some really interesting points in there. Yeah, that one was, uh, was a good one. It's a complex issue. Yeah, right? yeah. The more you learn, the more questions you have, it feels like. Exactly. And it makes you think, right? Like, have you ever just, you know, been outside on a crazy hot summer day? Oh, tell me about and it. And thought, like, is this normal? Or those, like, intense storms we've been seeing? Yeah, I mean, those are definitely attention-grabbing, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. But it's it's almost like the stuff we don't see that's, that's even more mind-blowing. It's true. It's like the planet's trying to tell us something, but we're mm -hmm. not quite picking yeah. up on all the signals. We need to learn the language, right? Exactly. So maybe we should start with the basics. Like, we hear global warming and climate change tossed around all the time. Mm -hmm. Are they the same thing? That's a great question. They're related for sure, but there is a distinction. Okay, good, because I was getting a little confused. Yeah, global warming is basically like taking the planet's temperature and seeing it rise over time, okay. like a long-term trend. Climate change is is kind of like looking at a patient's chart and seeing a whole bunch of symptoms. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that analogy. It's it's the broader shifts we're seeing. So changes in weather patterns, melting ice, right. rising sea levels, and even how whole ecosystems are, are being impacted. So like if global warming is the fever, climate change is the whole illness. Exactly. Got it. That makes sense. And the thing is, the vast majority of scientists agree that we humans are the main reason this is happening. Yeah. That seems to be the consensus. I know pasted text mentioned that too. Right. It's pretty clear in that source. Okay. So if we're the ones causing it, how exactly are we doing that? What's the, like the mechanism? Well, imagine the earth is like a giant greenhouse, which by the way is actually a good thing in this case, because certain gases in the atmosphere, like carbon dioxide, methane, they act like the glass of that greenhouse. Oh, trapping heat. Exactly. Yep. Trapping some of the sun's heat to keep the planet at a, you know, at a livable temperature. Without this natural greenhouse effect, it would be a, a totally different story. Yeah. I mean, we need some heat, obviously. Right. Otherwise, we'd be popsicles. Frozen solid. But the problem is we've kind of messed with that balance by pumping way too much of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Okay, so more glass on the greenhouse. Okay, exactly. And it's mostly from burning fossil fuels, things like coal, oil, natural gas. Right. And it's trapping more heat than we should, causing the planet to warm up faster than it naturally would. So it's not like fossil fuels are like inherently bad. It's just that we're... Right maybe overusing them. Yeah, we're disrupting a very delicate balance. Gotcha. And it's not just fossil fuels. Deforestation is a big part of this too. Oh, right, because trees absorb carbon dioxide. Exactly. Think of trees like the planet's lungs. Inhaling carbon dioxide, storing it away. Right, so when we cut them down. We're not only releasing all that stored carbon back into the atmosphere, but also getting rid of one of the ways the planet naturally absorbs it. Wow, that's like, yeah removing a giant air purifier. Exactly. And it throws the whole balance even further off. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So we've got these greenhouse gases. You mentioned carbon dioxide, methane, and... Um, nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide, right. Are they all equally, like, bad? They all contribute, but carbon dioxide or CO2 is kind of the main culprit, mostly yeah. from, you know, burning those fossil fuels and deforestation. Uh -huh. Then there's methane, which is actually much more potent at trapping heat than high. CO2, even though it doesn't stick around in the atmosphere quite as long. And that comes from, well, a lot of sources, actually. Livestock, landfills, natural gas production. Wow, so many different sources. Yeah, and then you've got nitrous oxide, which yeah. comes from agriculture and, and also fossil fuel combustion. Okay. It's not as abundant as the other two, yeah. but it's still a significant contributor. So it's all connected. It really is. In a way. So how much has the Earth actually warmed up because of all this? Well, your sources say the Earth's average temperature has increased by about 1.2 degrees Celsius or 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit since the late 19th century. Huh. That doesn't sound like much, but I guess. Yeah, think about it. If you turned your thermostat up by just 2 degrees... Yeah, I definitely notice. You feel it, right? For sure. And we're already seeing the effects of that warming. Yeah, and if we keep going down this path... 
it's just going to get more intense. kind of scary to think about. It is. And the average warming doesn't tell the whole story either. Right. Some areas are being hit harder than others. Exactly. Like the Arctic, for example. Oh, right. I've heard about that. Temperatures are rising twice as fast there. Wow. And we're seeing it firsthand. You know, melting glaciers, shrinking ice caps, rising sea levels. It's like the planet is sending out an SOS. It really is. The question is, are we listening? Yeah, it's a complicated situation, no doubt. It is. And and the consequences are pretty scary if we just ignore it all. Yeah. No, you're right. But it's not all doom and gloom, right? There's uh, there's actually a lot of, of innovation and action happening all over the world. Oh, okay. That's good to hear. Yeah, it's it's actually pretty inspiring. So so what are some of those solutions? Where do we even start with, with something this big? Well, it can feel overwhelming for sure. Yeah. But I think it helps to break it down a little bit. Your sources talk about two main approaches. Uh, mitigation and adaptation. Okay. Mitigation is all about preventing or, or reducing those greenhouse gas emissions in the first place. Kind of like, you know, turning down the heat on that stove. Right. Preventing the kitchen from getting any hotter. Exactly. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, one of the biggest things is transitioning away from fossil fuels. Right. And embracing, you know, clean, renewable energy sources like solar, wind, geothermal, hydropower. I mean, it, it's amazing to see how far those technologies have come. Oh, it's incredible, isn't it? Just a few years ago, solar panels were, were like this luxury item, mm -hmm. and now they're they're everywhere. Yeah, and it's not just about you know switching energy sources. Right. We also need to be smarter about how we use energy in general. Absolutely, improving energy efficiency in buildings, transportation, industry, all of that can make a huge difference. Yeah. So things like better insulation in homes or fuel efficient cars hmm. or or even just making sure those industrial processes are running as efficiently as possible. Yeah, all those little things add up. Doing more with less, that's the key. Right, right. And then there's this idea of carbon sequestration, mm. which is basically capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing it safely. Okay. Is that possible? It is. We can do it through natural methods like planting trees. Right. You know, they absorb CO2 as they grow. Right. Or we can use technology like uh, carbon capture and storage facilities. It's like cleaning up the mess we've already made. In a way, yeah. Which reminds me, we were talking earlier about deforestation yeah. being a problem. So protecting existing forests and even restoring degraded ones. It's essential. It's one of the best ways to, you know, soak up that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and protect biodiversity. Right, like protecting the planet's lungs, as we were saying. Exactly. And it's something we can all be a part of, you know, right. supporting sustainable forestry practices and making, you know, conscious choices about the products we buy. Yeah, yeah. Every little bit helps. It really does. Another area where we can have a big impact is is agriculture. Okay, how so? Well, sustainable farming practices, mm. reducing methane emissions from livestock, improving soil health, using less fertilizer, all of that can really lower agriculture's carbon footprint. So eating smarter and supporting farmers who are who are taking those steps. That's the idea. It's complex, but it seems like there are a lot of things we can do. There are, yeah. Even if we do all of this, though, is there still going to be some climate change that's unavoidable? That's the reality, unfortunately. Even with the best mitigation efforts, we're still going to see some effects from the emissions we've already released. Right. That's where adaptation comes in. Okay, so adaptation is about adjusting to those impacts that are already happening yeah. and preparing for future ones. Exactly. It's like, you know, learning to live in a new reality. Right, right. And there are many ways to adapt. For coastal communities dealing with rising sea levels, it might involve building seawalls or, or flood defenses to protect their homes and infrastructure. Wow. Yeah, I can picture those. Pretty impressive, right? <laughs> Buying them some time to adapt. Yeah. And in places facing, you know, more droughts. Right. Adaptation could mean developing better water management systems. Okay. Conserving water, you know, making every drop count. Becoming more water wise. Exactly. And as we see these extreme weather events happening more often, we need to to build more resilient infrastructure. Roads, bridges, buildings, oh, yeah. power grids that can withstand those shocks. Future-proofing our cities and towns. Exactly. But adaptation isn't just about physical things, right? It's also about our health systems. Oh, right, because there are health impacts from climate change. Exactly. Being prepared for, you know, more heat-related illnesses, respiratory problems from, from poor air quality. Mm. 
the potential for infectious diseases to spread more easily. Yeah, that's a good point. We need to be ready for all of that. Absolutely. Having the resources, the knowledge to protect public health in this changing world. So we've got mitigation, we've got adaptation, uh, but this is a global problem, right? It is. It's not something any one country can fix on its own. No, absolutely not. We need those international agreements, collaborations, a, a shared commitment to taking action. Yeah. It's a big task, but there have been some some really significant global efforts. Yeah. You mentioned the Paris Agreement earlier. Can you remind me what that's about? Sure. The Paris Agreement is an international treaty that aims to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius, preferably 1.5 degrees, okay. compared to pre-industrial levels. It was a huge deal yeah. getting pretty much every country in the world to commit to tackling climate change together. It's like a global pact recognizing that we're all in this together. Exactly. And there have been other efforts, too, like the Kyoto Protocol, which is an earlier agreement. Okay. Setting emission reduction targets for developed countries. Uh-huh. And then there are the COP meetings, the Conference of the Parties, where nations get together every year to discuss and negotiate climate action. It's like a global climate summit. Exactly. That's pretty cool. It is. And one of the tools they have in their toolbox is is carbon pricing. Oh, I've heard of that, but I don't really understand how it works. Well, the basic idea is to put a price on carbon emissions. Okay. Either through carbon taxes or cap and trade systems. So that would make it more expensive to pollute. Right. And that encourages companies and industries to reduce their emissions and and invest in those cleaner technologies. Oh, so it incentivizes them to change. Exactly. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. But let's be real. I mean, there have to be challenges and controversies when it comes to to dealing with climate change. Of course. It's such a, a politically charged topic. It is. And honestly, one of the biggest hurdles is just, you know, political resistance. Yeah, yeah. Some countries, particularly those that, that rely heavily on fossil fuels, have been reluctant to embrace those those really ambitious climate policies. I guess there are economic concerns and worries about jobs. Yeah, it's a tough balancing act for sure. It is, it is. And then there's the whole debate about, you know, who's responsible. Yeah. Developed countries, which have historically contributed the most to to those emissions are under a lot of pressure to take the lead in reducing their own emissions yeah. and also provide financial and technological support to to developing countries. It's a question of fairness. It really is. You know, who cleans up the mess yeah. and who pays for the, the cost of adapting. Exactly. It's a, it's a tough one. It is. And then yeah. you've got this whole problem of greenwashing. Oh, yeah. Where companies or governments try to make it look like they're doing more than they actually are. Right. Putting a green label on something that's not actually sustainable. Right. Consumers really need to be, to be aware. Yeah. Do their research, make sure they're not being misled. It's so important to hold, you know, companies and governments accountable for what they're actually doing. Absolutely. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here. The causes, the impacts of climate change, the solutions, the global efforts, the challenges. It's a lot to take in. It really is. Yeah. But I'm feeling a little more hopeful now that we've we've talked about some of the solutions and, and seeing all these people all over the world working on this. That's great to hear. You know, what's so fascinating about all this is is that we're really at a crossroads, you know? Yeah. The choices we make today are going to determine the future of our planet. Yeah, it's like we're standing at that fork in the road. Right. One path leads to to inaction, where we just keep burning fossil fuels. Things get worse. Yeah. More warming, more extreme weather. More consequences. Yeah. Yeah. The other path leads to action. Yeah. You know, embracing those renewable energies, mm -hmm. investing in sustainable technologies, working mm -hmm. together to create a, a more sustainable future. The choice is really ours. Yeah. Yeah, that fork in the road, it's a powerful image. It really is, isn't it? It kind of makes you think about, you know, individual actions versus collective action yeah. and how they all they all kind of come together. Right, because it's it's easy to feel like, what can I do? I'm just one person. Right. But when you think about it, all of our choices, they add up. They do. It's like every decision we make yeah. from from the food we eat to the way we get around the things yeah. we buy, even how we vote, yeah. all of it contributes to this bigger picture. It's true. It's like that butterfly effect, right? Exactly. One small action yeah. can have you know, ripple effects. So what are some things people can do in their everyday lives to make a difference? Well, there's so many things. We can, you know, walk, bike, take public transport. Instead of driving alone, we can eat less meat, more plant-based foods. Yeah. Support businesses that, that are really prioritizing sustainability. Right. Huh. And we can reduce our energy use at home. Yeah. 
I've been trying to be more mindful of that. It's amazing how quickly those little things can become habits, right? It really is. Like grabbing your reusable bag, turning off the lights when you leave a room. Yeah, it's it's not that hard. No, not at all. And it's not just about, you know, reducing our own footprint. Yeah. It's also about using our voices to advocate for, for bigger changes. Yeah. Talk to your friends and family about climate change. Exactly. Share information on social media. Support organizations that are that are fighting for this. Yeah, we can all be like ambassadors for change. That's a great way to put it. We can write to our elected officials. Yeah. Support policies that that promote sustainability. Right. Hold those businesses accountable. Exactly. It's about, you know, using our collective voice to push for a more sustainable future. Because we really are all in this together. We are, we're all part of the solution. So to everyone listening, I hope this has inspired you to take action. Me too. Even if it's just one small thing, it all makes a difference. Every little bit counts. We have the knowledge, the technology, the resources to address this. We do. What we need now is the will to act. The will and, and the hope, right? Yeah. That's what's gonna drive us forward. Well, thanks for joining us on this deep dive into global warming. It's been a pleasure. Knowledge is power. And action is hope. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, keep diving deep into the world around you.